next uh, let's invite Professor M. Harrow to give a final talk. And Professor Harrow is an associate professor of physics department at MIT. He has been working on quantum information science and quantum algorithms. He was a resident of 2015 MSF Carrier Award, 2017 Information Theory Society Best of Paper Award, 2018 Ralph Landau and Charles Bennett Award. Today, his talk's title is Hybrid Classical Quantum Algorithm for Optimization and Inference. Let's welcome. Thanks for, for coming, uh, and thanks to Etienne and the other organizers for, for inviting me. I am uh, said to be here. It's a, my baby photo. Uh, not my talk. There's the talk. Um, so uh, my work is on, is on quantum computers and quantum algorithms, uh, these hypothetical devices that we're, we're hoping we'll build, uh, that we, uh, we have a lot of that are, are interesting both from a practical point of view and a fundamental point of view. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then, you know, the, the LIDS is about, you know, about actually solving problems. So uh, I want to both tell you about the, the general theoretical idea of what a quantum computer would offer, but also trying to use it to, to solve problems related to inference and optimization uh, and, and my work, in, my recent work in, in that area. So, let me begin by, by telling you about the motivation for quantum mechanics. Uh, sorry, sorry, for quantum computers. Uh, so, you know, quantum mechanics is this theory that people kept on not wanting to believe, but the evidence just hit us repeatedly over the head until we accepted it. And one annoying feature of it is that it's exponentially hard to simulate quantum systems. If you have n quantum systems, the difficulty of simulating them does not just grow with n, it grows exponentially with n. And this is not just a theoretical thing, this is actually how, if you look at how DOE supercomputer time is used, these red categories are the ones where the difficulty basically comes from quantum mechanics. And if anything, that understates it, because the nuclear category might be simulating one proton, uh, whereas Earth science might be simulating the entire Earth's crust, or you know, simulating weather patterns across the whole world. So the, the complexity of quantum mechanics is really real, really is a barrier towards our ability to model and understand the physical world. And this was observed by Feynman and Yuri Lenin in the, independently in the Soviet Union in the 80s. Uh, and there's a series of, of, of insights, beginning with this difficulty. Quantum mechanics is hard to simulate classical. No way around that. People have tried since the basic theories of quantum mechanics equations were written down, we'll try to solve them, and our solutions are always approximate, they're always incomplete, they only work in special cases, the full solution always takes exponential time, we've never found, yet found a way around that. Uh, however, this uh, you know, eraser is clearly simulating itself, right? So what is this eraser doing that my laptop can't? Well, it's evolving according to the laws of quantum mechanics. So, Obviously, there's something in the world that can do this computation, just not this control, not a controllable computer. And so then you say, well, maybe I could build a programmable quantum system that could do that could be programmed to simulate whatever quantum system I like. This programmable thing, if you call a, pro, a quantum computer, would then solve this one problem of quantum simulation exponentially more quickly than I can do with the digital conventional quantum computer. That was that was Feynman's idea and Yuri Benin's in the 80s. And then, once you accept that there's this new computing paradigm that can solve at least one problem more efficiently, it opens the door to solving other problems, maybe even ones that do not look at all like quantum mechanics more efficiently as well. And that's sort of the, been the trajectory of, of our field. And I want to begin, uh, since I, I know some of you work in quantum computing, but many of you don't, I want to begin by, by telling you a little bit about the field in general, and then telling you specifically about my work in optimization inverse. So, the idea of, uh, of quantum computing follows the basic principle that led to digital computing, or the theory of digital computing, which is that we abstract away from the device, uh, the details of the device, into something called a bit. So if it's a bit in RAM, or hard drive, or abacus, the doesn't matter. We can talk about an AND gate and the logic of how you make a multiplication circuit the same way, regardless of the, the details of the device. And this idea has been called the Church-Turing thesis, that sort of any physical thing in the world should basically be able to compute the same types of questions. Uh, 
has been unchanged even when you go to seemingly exotic platforms like DNA computing and analog computing. They all are roughly equivalent in computational power until you get to quantum physics. And that was, for me, I think one of the most beautiful parts of the field is that you think of information computing as fundamental things, almost logical ideas that, that the ancient Greeks could have reasoned about. And, and this says that, that actually when you look at physics, the basic definitions of information computing are different. It's a little bit like what relativity did to space and time. Things where you would have previously said, I don't need a physics experiment to understand what space and time are. And then relativity says, actually, it's, it's more complicated than our intuition would say. And so quantum computers take account of physics in order to uh, define their computing abilities. However, they still get to abstract away from the details. There's just a different abstraction. So there are many different quantum two-level systems, uh, meaning a, quantum, a system that can be in one of two perfectly distinguishable states. So you can have a spin, up, a spin would have a particle, and its axis can either point up or down. Those are two distinguishable states. You can have photon polarization that can be either vertical or horizontal. Uh, you can have the state of an ion can be in the ground, the electron can be in the ground or the first excited state. You can have various excitations of a superconducting circuit. All of these, uh, we still, they're all different than classical, but they, we can still describe them by the common language of qubits. We don't need to def define a different computing theory for each one of these platforms. And how do qubits work? Their basic state space looks a little bit like a probability distribution, but with complex numbers called amplitudes. One qubit has two possibilities, and so we assign a complex number to each of those. It's a unit vector in the two norm, so for some of the absolute value squares add up to one. And n qubits, normally n bits have two to the n possibilities, n qubits have two to the n amplitude, so two to the n complex numbers, uh, such that it's a formed overall a unit vector. A little bit like a probability distribution, uh, but with, with complex numbers. It evolves according to, uh, the physics is according to Schrodinger's equation, and we can abstract this away into a, a gate model where you do one elementary gate analogous to a NAND gate or an XOR gate, uh, one basic gate at a time, and these are, are roughly equivalent in their, in their computational power. Now, many people say that the power of quantum computing comes from this exponentially large state space. Uh, and it is tempting to say that because, you know, it takes exponential number of complex numbers to write down a quantum state. However, it's important to note that this is not strictly true, that with classical computers you still can get this kind of exponential, uh, exponentially large state space, uh, exponentially large description complexity by using randomness. So if you have a, a classical computer and then these coins represent, you know, random bits, the state of that thing is a vector of length 2 to the n, just like in the quantum computer, uh, but now made up of probabilities instead of amplitudes, so real numbers that are not negative that add up to 1. And this really does give you uh, computational speedups for some problems over deterministic algorithms. For example, if I want to estimate a high dimensional integral, then the number of points I'd have to integrate over goes over exponentially in the number of dimensions. Uh, but with random sampling, I can often do way, way better. And this was observed in the very early days. You know, the Metropolis algorithm was one of the first ones. This is called the Fermi app, a mechanical computing device that Fermi developed when any app was offline and he wanted to do new tribe scattering experiments. Uh, using, again, using Monte Carlo. Uh, and so randomness has been with computing since the very beginning, uh, and it also gives rise to these exponentially long vectors. The difference is a little bit more subtle. It has to involve that these things are complex. Actually, negative numbers would already do. It has to do with the fact that the quantum computation, just like the probabilistic one, can split up its, and take many paths through a computation. But when you combine these paths, instead of probabilities adding, these amplitudes can add constructively or destructively because they're complex numbers. If they're in phase, they, their magnitude increases. If they're out of phase, they cancel out. And so because of this wave-like property of interference, quantum computers can do qualitatively different things. OK, so uh, that's, not, that's nice in principle, but you know, what, what are these qualitatively different things? One of them that is not the most powerful speedup, but is, I think, striking in terms of its generality is the speed up for quantum search. So I'm given the ability to compute a function f of i. i ranges from 1 through n. And f of i is always just 0 or 1. Very simple. It's like, does a password work or not work? And you want to find a value of i such that f of i is equal to 1. And let's say it's 
to the hard cases when the truth table is mostly zeros and there's maybe a single one or a handful of ones. Oh, thank you. And uh, how long does this take? On a classical computer, you evaluate at some point and you get the answer to zero. That's pretty uninformative. All you've learned is that that value of i was bad. It tells you nothing about the other ones. So the number of calls to f is going to scale like n. Uh, and Love Grover at, then at Bell Labs found that a quantum computer needed only square root of n queries to do this. Uh, evaluations of f. Uh, and the intuition for this comes to the difference between amplitudes and probabilities. So you take a quantum amplitude to get a probability from it, you do the absolute value square. And so while the uniform distribution over n things has probabilities 1 over n, the uniform superposition has amplitudes 1 over root n. And one basic iteration of Grover's algorithm can boost the probability of the correct one by 1 over, boost the amplitude of the correct answer by 1 over root n. A little bit analogous to how random guessing boosts your chance of finding the right answer by 1 over n each time, Grover's algorithm boosts the amplitude by 1 over root n. Uh, so it's remarkable that it's completely general. Like you think this f has no structure. How? What can I take advantage of algorithmically? There's nothing for my algorithm to get a handle on, uh, and, and yet you can get a, a big asymptotic speedup. And since then, we found many other speedups for other kinds of unstructured problems. So if I want to maximize a black box function, if I want to uh, approximately count the number of ones, uh, if I want to find collisions, let's say you know in like a like a cryptographic hash function, if I want to evaluate a game tree, uh, like white plays a move in chess, then black plays, and back and forth, and who wins, all these things, I get similar square root type speedups using similar ideas to, to Grover's algorithm. Um, so that's nice. It's, uh, it really shows the computing model is different, but the square root is not as dramatic, maybe not dramatic enough to justify that much investment in the technology. What really, I think, shocked people was uh, the, the factoring algorithm of short. So if you have an integer, a long one like this, you know, can you tell me what the two things are that multiply to, together to reach this? Well, if you just check all the possibilities, it'll take you a long time. Even if you use the best classical algorithm, which is way more clever, it's still going to be exponential of the cube root of the number of bits. And short is algorithm runs in time polynomial of the number of bits. Uh, it's shocking both because it, uh, it and its variants break many of the public key crypto systems that we use. Um, but also, because this problem has, on its face, nothing to do with quantum mechanics. If I tell you that a quantum computer can speed up the, solution, you know, the simulation of a quantum mechanical system, that might not be so shocking. But if I tell you that the best algorithms for factoring uh, need to rely on understanding the Schrodinger equation, the laws of quantum mechanics, that to me is very shocking. That to me says that you know, how we should define the, the complexity of a problem is, is really modified by physics. Uh, so that is, and if you compare it to Grover's, so the speed up is much more dramatic. Of course, the problem is way more specialized, right? It's a very specific problem. There are other problems like it, but they all rely on some kind of periodicity or some kind of group structure, some kind of heavy symmetry uh, that we cannot expect to find in a general purpose machine learning problem. One thing I worked on was a problem that tried to uh, get speed up in a more general class of problems. One such class of problems is a linear system of equations. Um, so you have inputs a and b, and you'd like to find a vector x such that ax is equal to b. Um, and often we want to have some conditions on this. So the condition number is the ratio of the largest to the smallest singular value of the matrix A. And that's the measure of how non-invertible it is. If the matrix is unitary, capital will be 1. As it approaches being non-invertible, capital will approach infinity. It's also a measure of the numerical instability of this process. You know, how much if I uh, tweak B by, how much will X change by? So there's a few parameters. Kappa, the dimension N, and F, the sparsity, the number of non-zero entries per row. So classically, we can solve this problem in time order uh, N, X, Kappa, log, whatever epsilon is, is the error. Um, I guess better if the matrix is positive and semi-definite, but, but otherwise it goes like this. Uh, and quantumly, we can get a similar runtime, but with n replaced by log n. So the other parameters are not improved, and those may end up dominating the runtime. The n dependence is much better, uh, but there's a catch, which is that it, it does really a different thing than the classical linear system solver. The classical linear system solver takes a vector of numbers that say live on your hard drive, and then transforms them to another set of numbers that live on your hard drive. This 
cannot afford to read n numbers, right? The runtime is less than n. So it cannot act on, it could not do the same task. Instead, what it does is it transforms the amplitudes of a quantum state. So if I have a quantum state with n amplitudes uh, that encode b, this can transform it to a state with amplitudes in code x in that amount of time. So we write ket b for the quantum state representing input b, and ket x for the quantum state representing output x. Um, and this is what enables the speed up, but it also is a big limitation on the algorithm as well. You cannot use it in all the cases you would use your original column. People have applied it to various things, uh, like simulating electromagnetic scattering. That's a case where the input state you really could prepare on a quantum computer, and for the output state, it's okay to just have it as a quantum state because you're, you're happy just to sample from, from where the wave front scatter to. You don't need to know, uh, you know, you know every bit of it. Uh, it's also been used to, to solve differential equations on a, on a quantum computer. Uh, but these conditions on the input have remained a challenge and have limited its applicability. Um, still, though, this is, I think, another, another promising area of quantum algorithms. And despite the best efforts of quantum algorithms researchers like me who want to extend the range of quantum algorithms, probably the most important quantum algorithm is still the original one, simulating quantum systems. Uh, and that's just because the classical simulations are limited. They either have to simulate small things or uh, systems with simplifying assumptions, like not very much entanglement. And there are a lot of real world systems, like if I have uh, metals interacting with organic molecules, the metals have tons of electrons and they're all active. You can't ignore them. Uh, and it's just too big for classical computers to be able to handle very well without making really terrible approximations. Uh, and these are involved in a lot of important processes. Uh, this is, I think, still going to be the most important application of, of quantum computers. And it's, I think it's also pretty interesting that the strengths of quantum computers are a little different than the strengths of classical simulators. Uh, for example, classical simulators are better at studying uh, static properties of systems, whereas quantum computers seem to be better at, at studying dynamics. So, I am hopeful that quantum computers will emerge as a tool for quantum chemists that will be able to answer often complementary questions about quantum chemistry, uh, different than what our, our existing tools are, are telling us. Uh, now, there's a few uses of quantum computers I've told you about. There's one more uh, you may have seen in the news recently. This was in the, in the New York Times and in many other places. was Google's announcement of what they call quantum supremacy. So quantum supremacy means there's some problem which you can solve on a quantum computer which you cannot solve on any reasonable classical computer. There's anything that we could build or that we have today. Um, and the catch, of course, is that it does not have to be a useful problem, right? So if you think about what I said, I, I'm not, within all those things, useful was not part of it. But I think that's fine. It's like, you know, what do you do when you make a new computer? You run some benchmarks on it. No one pretends they're, those are useful, but they're just telling you how powerful the chip is. Uh, and another way of thinking about this is, if we didn't have this, so until this happened, every quantum computer that was built could be easily simulated on my laptop, right? And so we still learn from those quantum computers. We learn about the difficulties of building quantum computers. We learn about what errors we'll have to fix to make yet bigger ones. We learn things like that. But we, there was no result of the computation that was ever going to come out that was going to surprise us. And Google's device is exciting because while the, the problem it solves is was somewhat contrived, it shows for the first time that quantum computers have gone beyond the stage of being simulable by my laptop. And it promises to ultimately transform our field from a theoretical one into one that's a lot more empirical, kind of like how computer science is transformed today. People still prove things about algorithms, but we also just run them and see how they work, and we learn a lot that way too. Uh, so that, I think, is an exciting development. Um, and it won't be overnight that this starts to, you know, we start to be doing useful things with them. But it's uh, I'm very exciting for people like me. When I started 20 years ago, I, I, had, I was just happy people would, would pay me to, to, to think about interesting math problems. I had no idea we would, we would one day reach this point. So uh, very happy that we've reached it, and I, I'm excited about them continuing to develop. Okay, so let me now tell you a little bit about um, my ideas about, uh, about inference and optimization. And to do this, I'm going to return to the quantum search. 
Um, so this in this problem, people have sometimes described it as you know finding a record in a database, right? And, and that's actually not you know if you've heard about it that way, maybe you've never heard of it that way, but if you've heard about it that way, it's actually not what this is doing. If you look at what Grover's search algorithm is doing, the input to the problem is the ability to compute a function. Right? I have to be able to compute this function f of i, and I have to be able to run that on a quantum computer. And the uh, and I guess maybe I'll use this, I'm going to switch to slightly different notation. I'm going to write f of i to be x sub i. So think of the input string as x1 through xn. But it's not a physical input string that lives on a computer. This is a, you could call it a synthetic data set. You know, like the, the set of possible outputs to a function. So I could compute any one of them that I want on the fly, but I don't actually have all the outputs of the function at one time sitting on my hard drive. Maybe it's even exponentially large, that would be, that would be infeasible. So this data model is sometimes called the oracle model, because it means that there's a, an oracle, or a, a subroutine, O, that takes in quantum state I and another register in the zero state, uh, just to, to store the answer, and maps it to I in the first register and X of I in the second register. So I can basically, uh, I have a, a quantum transformation that will extract the, the I-th bit of this string. And that just means I have a subroutine that will do it. Uh, but what's important is that this can act on superpositions. So if I have a superposition of different I's, some amplitude on I equals 3, and some amplitude on I equals 17, I have to map this to a superposition of I equals 3 in the first register, and X sub 3 in the second, and I equals 17 in the first register, and X sub 17 in the second. I can't break that superposition. I can't measure it and then randomly either get one or the other. I have to keep the superposition of both. I have to keep their relative phase, because later I might have to interfere them. And so their relative phase is going to determine how the interference works. And so classical hardware does not support that. So here's a picture of a data center that I got in Google Images. Uh, and if you want to query a data center, you can send in a little packet and it'll, it'll retrieve a bit for you. Uh, that does not fit this oracle model, right? If I try to make a superposition and say, oh, data center, please tell me about the superposition of location 2 and location 5 trillion, uh, it's going to effectively measure that thing because the data center is not a quantum computer. So it cannot handle superposition. By setting a superposition, it immediately leaks that information to the environment, which effectively measures it and breaks the superposition. Uh, so we could not access data in, in an actual, you know, I'm using data center as an extreme example, even my laptop hard drive is the same way. Uh, and anyway, it's, it's also not really what we'd want to do. Like, we wouldn't want to search a data center this way. We'd probably build an index, or if this, if we did have a big data center with a lot of hard drives, along with each hard drive is probably attached to CPU, we'd probably do our search in parallel. Uh, this doesn't really fit the model of, of how you'd want to use it to actually search through a large data set. Now, people have proposed um, something called a quantum RAM that you could, you could uh, query in superposition. Uh, and it's a, a promising idea, but it is a different type of hardware, sort of even yet beyond building a standard quantum computer. So I think it's worth pursuing that, but as a theorist, you know, looking at how hard the experimentalists are working, I feel like I should, I should propose algorithms that work on merely a conventional quantum computer and not some, you know, hypothetical, additionally powerful. So what can we do in that case? What if you have a normal quantum computer, uh, but you want to, you know, access a hard drive? I have a hard drive, let's say, with bits x1 through xn. I want this oracle. Um, if anyone has an idea for a good picture of an oracle, uh, can replace this one. That's what I came up with. So the oracle is going to map, you know, position a, a register in state i to one where state i comma x sub i. And one way to do this is you have these two quantum registers, i and zero, and you do this series of quantum gates. If i is the quantum gates will check coherently to see if i is one. If so, it will add x one to the second register. If i is two, it will add x two to the second register and so on. If I march through that entire sequence of instructions, I will have performed the oracle operation. Um, so that is, uh, 
a way of doing it. I don't actually need the quantum computer to access the whole hard drive at the same time. A, a reasonable data model is I have a laptop with a hard drive talking to a little FPGA that's talking to the pulse programmer that's, that's talking to the quantum computer. Right? So I can be stepping through the hard drive and the, the quantum hardware doesn't have to sort of see the whole thing at once. It just has to be patient enough to, 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 listen, to, watch, to wait for me to step through the whole hard drive. So, so that works, but it's kind of terrible. It has this order n overhead just to make one query, to retrieve one bit, you have to go through the whole hard drive. And that really is, uh, is quite bad. It seems to wipe out the entire quantum speed up. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know of any other way to do it. I don't know any other way to take a hard drive and to make a quantum oracle from it. I should say, what, you know, what are the solutions, what people come up with? Uh, so one of the first one is a quantum RAM, uh, which would do the job, but is an additional hardware requirement. Uh, I should say one further objection to a quantum RAM is that if you want one that contains n, that has n quantumly addressable bits, that might be as hard as building a quantum computer of size n. So it really may be, may be quite demanding. Uh, the other option is to say, well, maybe f of i is some easy-to-compute function. Like what Shor's algorithm does for factoring is it says f of i is a to the i mod n, where a and i are integers. This is something I can easily compute. I don't need a big hard drive for that. The quantum computer can easily do that in superposition, uh, rel relatively easily do it in superposition. Uh, and it's brilliant when that works, but it takes kind of creative insight for each problem to do that. There's no guarantee that there will be a meaningful way to compute the, the x that you want. So the approach I want to propose is one that draws on tools from classical machine learning to reduce the size of the data set to one that represents the uh, key features of the original one. And this can be used to give provable speedups for problems like clustering, uh, Bayesian inference, and saddle point optimization. So that's what I want to tell you about next. And let me be a little bit more concrete and tell you about the kind of problems that I want to consider. So um, one question, one problem is called maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, very general the way I've, I've put it. Um, I guess you could also say maximum a posteriori estimation, which is maybe might be, might be a slightly more accurate way to with the way I put it. So you have a set of models y and a data set x. And you want to find the best model that fits your data. So you want to maximize over the set y the log likelihood. Um, and the log likelihood is the log of the probability of data point x given log of y. Uh, take the log of that, we'll call that f of xy. And so if you sum that up, sum over all the x's, you get the log of the probability of observing this entire data set given a model. So that's the one I'm maximized, plus maybe this regularizer term r of y to tell you that maybe you have some prior over the models or you prefer for some reason some models over, over others. So that's a very basic problem that we'd like to solve. Uh, how can we use a quantum computer to do it? Uh, can we use the Grover speedup, for example? And if you look at this problem just as a math problem, the sets x and y appear almost symmetrically. I mean, I'm, I'm maxing over one and I'm summing over the other. But we have quadratic Grover speedups for both of them, uh, and so that is not a big problem. But the bigger difference is that their type of data is very different, right? So X is a set that lives on a hard drive. It's uh, you know, a set of data points that I do not have Oracle access or superposition access to. Whereas the set Y is the sort of synthetic data set that I can easily take superpositions over. For example, if we're a clustering problem, this might be the weights and centers of, of clusters. Um, so I can easily make a superposition over different things in Y. Um, so if I want to get the Grover speed up, if I do it by kind of the natural model of a classical computer talking to a quantum computer, uh, then the number of evaluations of f, this likelihood function, will go like the square root of the size of Y. I get my Grover speed up and searching over Y, uh, but it will also scale linearly with the size of the data set. I'll have basically no speed up over, uh, you know, I won't be able to speed up traversing the data set. Another way of looking at it is in this maximum followed by a sum, I can speed up the outer loop, I can speed up the max, but I cannot speed up the, the sum in the inner loop. So um, the key question is can we reduce the dependence on x? And, uh, 
and, and do this more efficiently. Um, and this is a problem that, that people have answered long before quantum computers came along. Uh, and one method that I think is useful here is to just do something called a core set, uh, which originated in computational geometry, but has been used in a lot of uh, machine learning and, and inference problems as well. The idea is if I have some data set X, maybe I want to, do, to cluster it, I can approximate that data set, at least for the purpose of evaluating clusterings, by a smaller, uh, possibly weighted data set X prime. And it's important to note here that I might not be able to get away with uniform sampling. Uh, if I have you know, one very large cluster and a bunch of smaller ones, uniform sampling would miss the smaller clusters, uh, which would do OK maybe for the average data point. But in terms of learning the right model, maybe those smaller clusters tell me something very important. Maybe the outliers are actually the ones that contain the interesting events, or, or for whatever reason I, I want to capture, uh, I, I don't want to overlook them. So it's a little more complicated than just uniformly sampling the points, uh, but it, uh, it uses similar ideas to, to be able to, uh, to, to get a weighted subset. And we say that X prime, this set, is a core set for all models Y, the, the true log likelihood, so the sum over X of F of X, Y, is approximately equal to the log likelihood that you get by summing over the, the core set instead. So instead of summing over x, it's it, the, the log likelihood you get by summing over x prime. And because I'm reducing the number of points, I probably am going to have to weight these points in the core set. So I add some weight, uh, w of x. And typically what happens with, say, important sampling is I want to make these smaller clusters, uh, I want to make sure they're represented. So I boost up their probability to sample them more often. And to compensate for that, I reduce the weight that they enter into the core set. So I might just sample a few points from a giant cluster, but I have to increase their weight to account for the fact that, that I made them unlikely to choose in the first place. And that, uh, there are other ways of constructing core sets as well, but the, the important sampling paradigm has been a, a, a pretty productive way to do it. So how can this be used to find a hybrid algorithm for, for machine learning? Uh, the idea is you have a data set X, you feed it to a classical computer that runs some important sampling algorithm. Uh, and these are pretty sophisticated. Um, I'm only not talking about them because they're, they're not my work. There's sort of a lot of people who've worked on different ways of, of doing important sampling. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll say a little bit about how they work. What they do is one way of doing this is to use a classical computer to get a very crude approximation of, of the best model, let's call it Y prime. For example, for a clustering problem, you could get a clustering that has a hundred times more clusters than, than you would ideally like. You want to find the best clustering into ten clusters, you find the best clustering into a thousand. And it's also not the best, but it's only within a factor of a hundred of the best. You know, something like that, where it's a very quick and crude approximation to the, to the optimal. Uh, and because you're you're fitting this crude approximation to the entire data set, you really do not want to spend too long doing it. Because evaluating, evaluating it against the entire data set uh, can be quite costly. So the classical computer finds some y prime, some, some approximate uh, model. Then it uses that to construct the important sampling weights. And so it turns out, even if you have just a just OK approximation, it can be used to find uh, these important sampling weights. Once you say, you know, weight these points highly, uh, don't weight these very much. Uh, and then you can use those to sample from your original data set to, to draw a, a core set X prime. And the important thing about this is that the size of X prime depends on features like the VC dimension of the model you're learning, the desired accuracy, uh, things like that, but it doesn't depend on the size of the original data set. So no matter how big the original data set is, uh, you can cut it down to a, a small size by, by using a core set. So then you pass this core set to a quantum computer that can run uh, some optimization algorithm. So I've been talking about Grover for, for concreteness. Um, Grover is good in that we understand it really, really well. Uh, and I like to focus on Grover because it's been around for you know, almost 25 years and people have not found a convincing way to use it for machine learning. Uh, so I think that's a worthwhile thing. However, it's only a quadratic speedup. 
And it may be better to use other quantum optimization algorithms, something called the adiabatic algorithm, something called quantum walks. There are a number of other uh, quantum approximation algorithms, which generally speaking, at this stage, I would call uh, heuristics in that they, you know, they're kind of like simulated annealing. Simulated annealing, you can sometimes prove it works, but often you just run it and you can't prove it works. So there are many quantum algorithms that are in this class, where sometimes we can prove on some classes of problems that they do well, uh, but we're probably just going to run them well beyond their, their provable range. Uh, and hopefully we'll get much better speed up than growth. Uh, but wh whatever algorithm you want, whatever algorithm you're going to use, you still have to have this inner loop where you evaluate the cost function. And so now that cost of the inner loop just scales like the size of x prime. And to be concrete, if we're going to do Grover, uh, now the cost is going to be the size of x prime, kind of the square root of the size of y. And this is, um, this is, let's just fulfill much, uh, do a much better job of achieving the Grover speed up. Think of x prime as much, much smaller than the other parameters of the problem. This now gives us nearly a full quadratic speed up. Whereas before, the Grover speed up was really washed out by having to, to pay for this entire cost of, of going through the data. So, uh, that's kind of the first thing I would propose is to use this for things like, like clustering. Um, and I think it's a compelling way to use a quantum computer, but since my job is a quantum algorithm designer, I feel duty bound to come up with some role for the quantum computer that is a little bit more glorious than this. Because, you know, this is like the classic computer is like the model bird that flies out, gets the food, brings it back, chews it up into an easy to digest form, and then the, you know, the quantum computer is just like the baby bird that just gets this, this pre-digested data set that's very easy to analyze. So, uh, you know, maybe the, classroom, the quantum computer could do a little bit more. Um, and so, in particular, could there be rounds of interaction between the quantum and the classical computer? Maybe the, qu the quantum computer gets some data and says, okay, I've analyzed it, and what I really like is some more examples that look like this. Can you go out and get those for me, please? And then the classical computer, uh, so the quantum computer is using its strength of being able to do a search over a vast search space, you know, in over an implicit search space. Then the classical computer takes what it gets from the quantum computer, and its ability is it, it has a big hard drive. And so we can use that and search through its giant hard drive for some more records to hand to the quantum computer. And they go back and forth like this. So are there any benefits of doing this? Um, and one approach is, uh, well, there are a few different people. These are folks, I guess it were, uh, Tamara Broderick still at MIT. Trevor Campbell is at uh, UBC now. Uh, and then this is a, a review article by a bunch of people about uh, adaptive important sampling. And I'll, I'll present an idea that uh, I learned about from Campbell and, and Broderick. Uh, for a problem that's not maximal likelihood estimation, that's what I've talked about so far, but closely related problem of Bayesian inference. Um, and the idea is the following. I still have f is my log likelihood. I still have y is my basic models. x is my data set. Um, actually, maybe I should pause before I go on to this next topic. Any questions about what I did so far? Well, I'm about to introduce a new problem, so any questions about the old one, maximum likelihood? I mean, I'll do questions at the end also, but okay, good. Um, Bayesian inference, I have a prior, I'll call it pi zero of y, and my posterior pi of y is going to be influenced by the data. Okay, so I've got all my data at x, and that's going to you know, shift my probabilities by Bayes' rule to get my posterior pi of y, that's what I want to sample from. And so, uh, how can I use a quantum computer to help with that? Well, just like maximizing or approximately counting, quantum computers also get a square root speed up in uh, rejection sampling. And actually, also quantum walks get things, it's a little more complicated, but in many cases they get a square root speed up for uh, speeding up rapidly mixing Markov chains. So a classical Markov chain would mix in time one over the gap. Quantum, quantumly, you can get that in one over square root of the gap. Um, but there's a few, a few asterisks associated with that, but, but often you can do that. So uh, that's actually nice because you're not just simulating, a, you're not just speeding up brute force search, which is you know, usually not even close to the best algorithm, but if you're, if you're speeding up Markov chain sampling, 
you know, that feels pretty good. Like, you're, you're actually taking the best classical algorithm and quadratically speeding it up. That's more likely to give you something competitive. However, you know, there's still that killer inner loop where you have to sum over all of x. So, one thing we could do is we have the classical computer, in one step of the algorithm, takes data points x1 through xt, uh, along with weights w of x1 through w of xt, basically a core set that they've built up so far, it's a t point. And the quantum computer will use that to construct a sample y sub t, not from the true posterior, but from the posterior corresponding to this core set. Okay? So you, instead of the log likelihood, you have this weighted, you know, approximation of the log likelihood corresponding to this core set. Uh, so it solves kind of the Bayesian sampling problem of the core set we have so far. And then the classical computer chooses the next point for the core set along with this weight uh, by looking at the core set it has so far as well as the set of models that the classical computer has, I'm sorry, that the quantum computer has returned so far. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, that is now a classical algorithm. This is the thing that, that Campbell and Roderick proposed. So, um, I could go over, I could go over it, but sort of orthogonal to what I proposed. You know, I think the important thing is that the quantum computer returns these successfully better models, and the classical computer can use it to, to refine its core set. You know, basically to find points in the data that do not fit the model well. And then, so if you add one of those points, then that forces the quantum computer to then adjust its model to, to accommodate the new data. Um, so Campbell and Broderick have a scheme for this, which uh, is, is nice, it's sort of it seems to work well in many cases, but it's hard to, to prove that it always does. So I want to give my last example of one where, um, where I can prove that the thing works, where you know, the, the problem is well-defined, not heuristic. Uh, I can prove that it works, and that it's nearly optimal, actually, that you couldn't, that you couldn't do much better. Um, and the, the problem is saddle point optimization. So it's a little bit less general than the ones I talked about before, but, but still quite general. Uh, and I'm going to change my sets x and y slightly. x is still determined by the classical data set, but now I want x to be the convex hull of my point x1 through xn. So this is, um, like well, if you're in lib, you probably know what the convex hull is, but you know, it's the smallest convex set containing all these points. Uh, and the set y is the, that will optimize over the quantum computer will be the set of probability distributions over m items. So think of it as maybe there are m different strategies, and you want to fractionally allocate your resources to these m different strategies um, in a way that does well on all of these data points. And we want to do well in kind of a minimax sense. So we want to do well even on the worst data point. So it's not like clustering where we want to sort of do well on average over the data set. Here, our, our score is really governed by the, uh, by the worst, so the raw DM score. So the problem here is minimax. Uh, so we want a maximum over y. So find the best distribution over models y that does well on the minimum, uh, you know, that minimizes over x, that does well on all the x's. Uh, and von Neumann's minimax theorem says I can reverse the order. This is equal to min x maximum y of the same quantity. And this, this set of, of problems is, is fairly broad. The way I've formulated it, it really sounds like a zero-sum game uh, between an X player and a Y player. The Y player is trying to maximize, the X player is trying to minimize, uh, and F is the payoff for the Y player, minus F is the, player, play, the payoff for the X player, you want to find a Nash equilibrium. Um, I guess what doesn't make it fully general is that it's important that the X strategies are indexed by a classical computer, and the Y strategies are something you can do superposition queries over. Um, for these bottom type problems, though I think that makes sense. Uh, the family also includes linear programming. So if y is a space that I want to optimize over, and x is a set of linear constraints, then I want to find a point in y that satisfies all of the linear constraints. So uh, that is linear programming, as long as my set is a subset of the, of the simplex. Uh, it also has some similarities to maximum likelihood estimation. Except I have this minimum over x instead of a sum. So if the sum over x in maximum likelihood estimation was dominated by one really bad data point, then this would look kind of like this model. So it's uh, maybe an approximation of the of maximum likelihood. 
And finally, uh, this can be related to a kind of uh, FVM in the where you're looking at things that are in the L1 norm instead of the usual L2. Uh, and I think Subrik Sra has actually written a nice paper about L1 SVM. So he knows more about it than I do, but I can, I can tell you more about that afterwards if you, if you like. Okay, so what is the algorithm for this? Uh, it's going to follow a, an algorithm from the mid 90s by Gregorianis and Kachian. Uh, and I'll illustrate it with a zero sum game, very simple one rock, paper, scissors. So here's the payoff matrix for, for rock, paper, scissors. Um, and you want, this is going to be an algorithm that will efficiently find a, uh, a Nash equilibrium for this game, or rather, an approximate Nash equilibrium for this game. Um, and one th way you might think of doing this is to say, do something a little bit like gradient descent. So pick a strategy for the X player, um, and then have the Y player do a best response to that. And then the X player do a best response to that, and so on. But for rock, paper, scissors, you can see that's not going to work very well, right? Because X does rock, and then Y does paper, and then X does scissors, and it's just going to cycle on forever. It'll never converge. So you need to add a little bit of noise, a little bit of randomness, uh, to, to make this thing converge, and, and then it actually converges very quickly. Uh, and I should say that in modern years, people have started to recognize this as something called uh, Mirror descent, you've heard about that, uh, sort of a variant of gradient descent that, that looks at the norm of the, of the space a little bit more carefully. Uh, it's also related to the multiplicative weights method, uh, related to a lot, of, a lot of things people have looked at in recent years. So, what is the algorithm? So, first, I'm going to pick x1 arbitrarily. And so, let's suppose the x player chooses rock. Okay? Uh, now, that induces a payoff, a set, a payoff vector for the y player. But, and the Y player is not going to choose the best strategy with, for that payoff vector, but will bias her answers towards the better strategies. So there'll be a distribution, e to the epsilon a sub x1, y1, that will give me a distribution over, over y1. So I'm going to weight it more towards the values of y1 that increase the payoff. And uh, we'll sample from that distribution. Let's suppose that you know, the Y player happens to pick the, the slightly most likely one, which is paper. Um, now, that induces some payoff for the X player. And now, let's go back. Uh, we have this column here, payoff. And we sample same thing for the X player, except now there's a minus sign there. Okay? And now, let's suppose the X player happens to choose paper. You know, not the best one, but not the worst. Uh, and now, the way we continue is we have the Y player respond to all the rows that have been played so far. You know, maybe even counting repetitions. And so, at the beginning of this algorithm, the, the players are kind of choosing at random. But as the rows get repeated, it becomes exponentially unlikely to choose a bad strategy. And this thing will converge uh, very quickly to a, to a near Nash equilibrium. And in particular, what Gregorius and, sorry, Gregorianis and Kachian showed is that uh, the error you get is going to be epsilon times the largest entry of the payoff matrix after amount of time that goes like 1 over epsilon squared times the log of the number of strategies. So uh, it's kind of remarkable because you, you don't even need to, to actually look at the entire payoff matrix if you're doing this on a classical computer. Um, because you know, each one of these evaluations, you just look at one row and one column. So if your thing is an n by n grid, you're, it's really like n log n time. You're not even looking at the full input. And this algorithm is well suited to running on a hybrid uh, quantum classical computer. So how does it work? There are these capital T rounds of alternations. And in each iterate, the classical computer will have to look through the entire data set. Uh, and, you know, sample from the resulting distribution. Uh, but for each data point, we'll just do a very quick calculation, something scalar with, with capital T. And the quantum computer will have to use Grover or whatever other quantum algorithm you like, uh, but the inner loop of that is also going to be order T. You know, the time to, to evaluate the cost function for a given strategy for, on the quantum computer, it only depends on this handful of strategies that's received so far from the classical computer, and so that's going to be also very efficient. And so I say it's nearly optimal because the classical computer at, at least has to sweep through the hard drive once. 
And here it's barely doing more than that. It's sweeping through an order t times, and, and each time it's, uh, it's looking at, it's doing a very quick calculation. Likewise, for the quantum computer, surely we're willing to do Grover or whatever your favorite optimization algorithm is at least once. And here you have to do it again only t times and with a small inner loop. So it's hard to really improve on, on either the classical or the, or the quantum world. So, um, yeah, just to wrap up, I, I use Grover kind of to, to say something concrete, uh, but as I, as I said before, that square root speedup might not be what we ultimately want, that it's maybe hard to justify the, the added difficulty and expense of building a quantum computer if your speedup will only be a, a square root. So I'm hoping the, the other heuristics will, will replace Grover here. Um, and finally, I think it's, uh, it points to a direction for quantum algorithm designers where we should think harder about the role of the classical computer and of the two really working together. And an example of where this hybrid model of computation has been tried before is uh, on the left we have Gary Kasparov losing to Deep Blue. And afterwards, he thought about, you know, how should humans proceed from here in playing chess? And he, I don't think he came up with or popularized the idea of uh, what's called centaur chess or hybrid chess, where you have a human computer team playing together. Uh, and there was a period when the chess ratings of the computers, of course, were better than people, but the hybrid teams had even higher ratings than the computers. Um, unfortunately, now uh, we don't really help the computers anymore. Uh, when we work with them, we, we, uh, we don't increase their ratings at all. Um, but there was a period in which humans had a, a useful contribution to make to this. And, uh, and so I think as a quantum algorithm designer, uh, it's worth trying to find ways of, of meaningfully partnering with, with classical computers and using the strengths uh, of both platforms in new and creative ways. And, and hopefully some of you will, will think of, of new ways of, of doing this as, as you go forward with your, your research careers. Okay, thank you everyone for your attention and I'll stop here for questions. people can expect to like uh, do the experiment. Uh, for example, what kind of task for machine learning uh, people can try? Right, so I guess the Google quantum computer was 53 qubits. And if you think about, you know, how does that compare with classical computers? If you want to simulate 53 qubits on a classical computer, that's going to be 2 to the 53 complex numbers. So, just slightly out of reach of our big supercomputers. But you could say that what you're doing there is you're comparing the two on the problem that's designed to favor the quantum computer. Right? So when I say, like, how good is my you know, Apple versus an IBM computer, I don't judge my Apple in terms of its ability to simulate what the IBM computer is doing. You'd say, well, that's an unfair comparison because your thing has to run the overhead of the simulator. Right, so, um, and that's fine. I think we, we deliberately, ch Google deliberately chose that unfair comparison because uh, they wanted to show quantum supremacy. But then once you, um, yeah, once you start to move to other problems where there's some overhead, it'll take longer before we, we outperform classical. Uh, and I think the first things where we'll see outperforming classical are in uh, quantum chemistry and, uh, and materials. So I think that's what people should expect to be first. Um, I guess one other piece of work I've been working on is, uh, it, I guess another form of, of hybrid algorithm is how can you improve the, there, there are a lot of quantum algorithms for chemistry that use gradient descent. So the idea is that you have a series of, you, you parameterize your quantum circuit by a bunch of, of real parameters, uh, and you try to optimize those to to uh, minimize some objective, like the, uh, you're trying to change, you're trying to find the wave function for a given molecule to have the lowest energy. 
And so the outer loop is classical gradient descent. And so I think maybe this is another thing that live people could think about is how do you how do you do want to do gradient descent best if your inner loop is some expensive quantum computer, uh, you know, minimize the number of calls to that, or, or maybe even change those calls to make them most informative to the to the classical outer loop. So I think that is going to be some of the some of the earliest stuff that we see for quantum computers. For what I said, let's say you want to do clustering on a quantum computer. Well, the outer loop is Grover, so you know that that may take a while. Uh, but even the inner loop of clustering, you have to evaluate the cost of some clustering, which means you have to do a bunch of arithmetic, right? You have to compute the Euclidean distance to the cluster centers, and quantum computers have no particular advantage in arithmetic. Like it's pretty quick either way, but you know, not with 53 qubits. So it's going to be a while before these algorithms, uh, these, these are not going to be for the very first quantum computers. Uh, and I guess the last thing I'll say about machine learning is, so I've given my overview of what quantum computers are useful for, and I did not really say machine learning. Machine learning is the area where there's the most hope, or I guess current research about what quantum computers might do. Um, my talk is, I think, you know, a contribution. So a, I'm trying to show how quantum computers will solve machine learning problems. And you saw that my results are relatively modest. You know, like you still have to do the arithmetic. It's not going to be useful before you at least have thousands of qubits. Um, and so I would say, in terms of what quantum computers are good for, we know very well they're going to be great for chemistry, material science, nuclear physics, all these quantum simulations. Uh, the research is kind of going more towards machine learning because that's where the biggest question marks are. The potential payoff is even bigger, but our uncertainty is also much bigger. And we have ideas that we're really just very uncertain about how, how useful they will be. So yeah, I wish I had a better answer, but hopefully the community will, will have one at some point. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, yeah. so the talk focused on quantum computation. Yes. Uh, so uh, what do you think about communication between multiple quantum computers? Do we need to think about uh, communication completely differently from the way we think about communication between cluster computers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what about communication between quantum computers? Um, there are two types of communication, classical and quantum. So if they can exchange quantum bits, uh, then in a, you can use them basically to make a larger quantum computer. And this is, I think, one of the more promising approaches to building a quantum computer. Um, you can do, there's a very useful primitive called teleportation, uh, which is, it's not as great, maybe not as great as it sounds, but still a pretty great primitive. And the way it works is, if, I don't know, these are two little quantum computers, and this one sends a qubit to, one quantum computer sends a qubit to the other one, then they establish entanglement. And they can save that entanglement for later. And then later, they can use that to uh, transmit a, a message, a quantum a qubit from one quantum computer to the other one, by consuming that entanglement and also sending a classical message. So it's not faster than light, because you still have to send the classical message. But what's good about that is you can save up piles of entanglement in reserve. And then when you needed them, and you can even, it might be noisy entanglement that you then purify. You throw away the bad ones. You know, you wait till you're really sure you have some good entanglement, and only then you entrust your precious quantum data to it to teleport it from one node of the processor to another. One. So teleportation is a very promising way of making a modular quantum computer, um, sort of building on the fact that we have good classical communication between the nodes. You could also say, what about a modular quantum computer with classical communication between the nodes? Actually, Tianyi and I have worked on this a little bit. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a, an enormous difference. Like, let's say I have a, a 2,000 qubit quantum computers and they talk to each other classically, versus I have 1,000 qubit quantum computer and I just use it twice as many times. Um, there's, pop, there's not, in principle, there could be a difference, but uh, there's not really much of a difference that we've been able to using these quantum computers is by simulating quantum processes. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, could you please elaborate more on that? What are the physical uh, quantum processes that are used to use these data and store it in a quantum space? Um, 
So, yeah, the question is, you know, say more about what quantum simulation looks like. Um, and there's a few quick things that you want to do. You, um, one thing you might want to do is you might want to find, you know the set of interactions. Let's say you have some molecule, and you know, and let's say you, you, have a, you know where the nuclei of the molecules are. So uh, those are kind of fixed, they're slow moving, but you've got a bunch of electrons. And you want to figure out what configurations is the lowest, what is the lowest energy configuration for all these electrons. And that's easy to solve for one atom. They kind of have these shells, you know, they, they give you the periodic table. But for a molecule, where they're all interacting, it can be a little more complicated. Uh, and so what you do is you, um, one thing you can do on a quantum computer, the variational algorithm that I was mentioning, is you use the quantum computer to prepare some state of the electron. That is a uh, usually it's parameterized by some by some angles that you can turn that you can tune, and then with that you can use a quantum computer to measure the energy of those electrons. And we know uh, that in general the molecule will be in, a, in its lowest energy configuration. That's because at room temperature we compare room temperature to the energy scale of these molecules. Uh, basically, 99.999% of the time. They're, they're in their lowest energy configuration. So the goal, it's a little bit like you want to, you have a constraint satisfaction problem, like three set, and you want to find the setting of the bits that, that maximize the number of, of uh, satisfied constraints. So similarly, you want to find uh, a tuning of these parameters to repair a state of the electrons that has the lowest possible energy. Uh, and it does actually have the same hardness as things like three sat, but, you know, nature is usually not trying to be tricky. Like, these don't include cryptographic problems. Um, and molecules tend to find this configuration themselves just by evolving naturally. So, we don't think it's as hard, like, we don't think that computational hardness is really a big barrier. Um, and so, by tuning these angles, we can have the quantum computer get a, a good approximation of the ground state. And then, you could also study dynamics by doing something like exciting one of the electrons or bringing in another molecule and watching how it evolves, uh, that's something else you could do on the quantum computer. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that started to answer your question or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a big field. I mean, I, I just kind of scratched the surface of it. Yeah, it's a big field. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, um, we are these students that with background of inference, communication, control, and so on. And how much physics do you suggest us to learn in order to perform some meaningful research in quantum computing, quantum communication? Right. Yeah, do we have to, I mean, of course we do need to learn something like the Schrodinger's equation, but do we have to learn something from classes like quantum optics or like ions and so on? So the question is how much physics do you have to know? Um, and the field, you know, nowadays, people, I'm like one of the first generations of people who just got trained in quantum computing, but for a while there'd be people who just came from a computer science or a physics background. And the physicists would get very unhappy if you talk about NP and complexity classes. And the computer scientists would get very unhappy if you said a lot of physics things would, would really set them off. And we, you know, we eventually developed our own specialized vocabulary. Um, but you really, I think, do not need to know a lot of physics. Uh, so Umesh Vazirani is a computer scientist from Berkeley who has these online classes where he, I think he's teaching quantum computing to like first year computer science students. You do not need to know the Schrodinger equation. Like, you get the gate model, you can turn the Schrodinger equation into the gate model, and then you can just use gates, and that's fine. It's kind of like if you're doing, uh, you know, you're, you're designing circuits out of NAND gates, you don't really need to know how you got those from the transistors, right? You can just believe that the NAND gates work. Now, if you want to study some things, like how do I reduce errors in an ion trap quantum computer, you're going to need to know more physics. But you can do a lot by just knowing the computer science. Okay. And we have a few classes at MIT that, uh, that do quantum computing without assuming a background in quantum physics. Yes. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Okay, thank you.